Hey, what's good? My name is D. Elliot Woods, and you're listening to Fascination Street, the greatest podcast in the universe, hosted by the one and only Steve Owens. Yeah! A.V. in your ears, that's Ambush V, giving you this audio visual down the most interesting street in the world, with my boy Steve, Fascination Street. Y'all already know, let's get it when you went for the Fascination Street. What do you- Welcome back, Streetwalkers. This episode is with author Scott R. Jones. Scott is a Canadian who made a name for himself creating and editing for the Martian Migraine Press, which was a small press that released anthologies mostly centered around short stories with the through line being some sort of H.P. Lovecraftian touchstone. Back in 2020, uh, Scott released his very first novel, called Stonefish, which was released to wide acclaim. In this episode, we talk about how he became an author, some of his previous careers. We do talk a bit about the Martian Migraine Press and why he decided to start that and run it. Then we talk about his first novel, Stonefish, and what made him write that. Then we talk about his newest novel called Drill and what that's about. Drill is expected to be released in mid-June of this year, so pay attention to that. Uh, You'll hear towards the end, we start talking about some hashtags, and maybe we can help get some buzz going. So if you could help a brother out and send out some of those hashtags, and you can attach them to uh, retweeting and reposting of this episode if you want. That'd be swell as well. This episode is produced in part by David Himley, with help from Sally Zabava. So thank you both for helping make this episode happen. And this is my conversation with horror fiction author Scott R. Jones. Prepare to be fascinated. Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Scott R. Jones. What's up, man? How you doing? Hey, Steve. Uh, not too much. Glad to be glad to be on the show with you. It's hundred percent my pleasure. Where are you? You're in Canada, BC, right? Yeah, I'm on the far west coast of Canada in the little town called Victoria on Vancouver Island, which is all the way on the west coast. I don't know a whole lot of boot where you are. A whole lot of boot. <laughs> well, for one thing, we don't uh, we don't use that accent on this side of the country. <laughs> oh, check it's about up. it's about oh, over here <laughs> as it should be. Well, Scott, what I like to do is I like to start from the beginning. It helps us understand how the guests got from where they were to where they are. So, uh, where were you born and raised, man? Where'd you grow up? Uh, I was raised in Victoria. Uh, I went away after uh, after high school and stayed away for about two decades, but then I returned. And uh, happy to be back home for sure. Gosh, what can I tell you about what it was like to be raised here? I was raised in a cult. Well, we're going to get to that a little bit later when we talk about hashtag summer of drill, I think. Absolutely. No, no problem. So what made you leave (laughs) that area and then what made you come back? I left for work. At the time, I was a graphic designer and I, I, I went east in Canada at the time. Lived in Saskatoon for a little while and Toronto in Ontario, Ottawa. Yeah, mostly just for work. What were you, homeless? Good Lord, man. Pick a place and stay there for a while. (laughs) Oh, gosh. I like to see my country, so I've moved around quite a bit. (laughs) So I've only been to Toronto, but I think it's pronounced Toronto. Toronto. T-R. Toronto. That's the only place I've been to in Canada, and it was wildly different than I had imagined. It was beautiful, and I guess downtown Toronto has like this whole underground network of shops and breezeways and restaurants and stuff that just blew me away i was like what is this this is crazy (laughs) that's our that's our civilization up here (laughs) so you started off at graphic design what made you decide to do that as a career as a career well i always enjoy drawing and illustration and graphic design on the computer you know was fascinating to me at the time and uh, yeah i just kind of stuck with it from then you went on to be a massage therapist how come (laughs) <laughs> I burned out. I burned out as a as a graphic designer and decided I wanted to try something completely different. That is completely different. Completely different. I, I switched up. I got my education and became a registered massage therapist. Did that for about a decade. And then did you get burned out on that too? I didn't so much get burned out as I became 
unable to handle bodies anymore. <laughs> what does that mean? Does that mean your hands started hurting or you got icked out from seeing people's bodies? No, it was more the latter. I basically burned out on naked people. I got to a point, though, even though I was helping folks out with their health issues and, and what have you, it just became a little much. So I switched again and became a mailman, which I've been doing for the last decade or so. In Canada, did we say mailman or postman? We will say mailman, we will say postman, but most often uh, people like to say posty. A posty. Oh, you're a posty. Like a Mountie or a Stady, you're a posty. Exactly. It's all federal employment, so. That makes sense. You're a Fetty. Wait a minute. So mm -hmm. uh, I've seen Kevin Costner's The Postman. Is it anything <laughs> like that? <laughs> <laughs> Up here? No, not so much. <laughs> okay, so from Paperboy to Postman, is that the name of your autobiography? Oh, no, no, not not yet. I have no idea what <laughs> to call that when it, when, when it comes time. We're going to jump all over the place here with, with your story. But at a certain point, you edited for Martian Migraine Press. Did you create Martian Migraine Press? I did, yeah. It was a small boutique operation, if you will. So it was just me and occasionally a few others that I hired to help out with production. But yeah, I, was, I edited anthologies for that press. I put out one of my own books through that press. Mostly my anthologies were Lovecraftian based. So we would take as a starting off point, we would take a Lovecraftian story and then we would build on the themes of that story. And I would solicit stories from writers that I knew, writers I didn't know. We just generally put together an anthology based on a particular theme. So for instance, we had our first book was called uh, Resonator. New Lovecraftian Tales of the Weird, and it was all based on H.P. Lovecraft's story From Beyond. So we included From Beyond in there because, of course, Lovecraft's material is all public domain now. So we included that, and then every story riffed on the technology and the horror of that particular story. So, so in the same way that the Black Mirror episodes are all really have this technological thread going through it, kind of like that? Kind of, yeah. Okay. What made you decide to start Martian Migraine? Like, why? You went from graphic design to massage therapist to postman, and now you're like, hey, I know what I'll do in all my free time. <laughs> At the time, ebooks were just coming up. This was around 2013, 2014. So, ebooks were becoming the next big thing. And I realized how simple they were to put together, for one thing. And a fellow writer I knew uh, at the time gave me some advice regarding the new structure of publishing vis-a-vis -vis Amazon and just putting your own work out there. And his advice to me was interesting. He was basically like, when you have a book, there are certain leveling aspects to the Amazon experience, right? So as long as your book looks professional, is edited professionally, has all the earmarks of a book, then it's not going to be any different from, say, a book put out by the big five, particularly if it's an ebook. So that's how I started. But eventually, I came around to the idea that I really wanted to put out actual physical hard copy books. And that was a bit of a learning curve, not too much. I managed to get a handle on the design aspect of it and began putting out both electronic copies of our anthologies and, and physical books as well. So you were able to put out Dead Tree versions? Dead Tree versions, exactly. Yeah. What was the hardest part of that? Was it finding somebody to manufacture them, or was it the design, or what was the hardest part of the Dead Tree version? Oh, I would have to say copy editing. <laughs> How is that different than copy editing for an ebook? Because you're also building the book block as well, how it's going to look in the actual physical copy. There's a lot more design aspect to that. But eventually, you know, I smoothed it all out and it became quite a good process. As well, I took time with these books. You know, I, I basically set myself a yearly schedule, one book per year, and it worked out really well. For the time that I did it, it was a really enjoyable process. And I think we put out some entertaining books for people to read. That's all that matters at the end of the day. Yeah, the, exactly right. For an artist, that's all that matters at the end of every day. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you edited for Martian Migraine Press 
was an anthology of sorts called Cthulhu Sattva. Cthulhu Sattva, indeed. Can you tell me how this came about and what the connective tissue is for that particular anthology? For that anthology, we were looking at the state of weird fiction and horror and finding that it was a lot of the same old, same old, you know, a a lot of uh, Lovecraftian pastiche, you know, a lot of weird horror pastiche and parody, or just rehashing the same old things. And one thing that's always fascinated me about the Lovecraftian mythos is the idea that mankind is just a tiny drop in the ocean of the universe, and that there is so much more to our existence than we imagine. But what I wanted to do with that was, instead of having Lovecraftian stories where, you know, you have destructive cults and great old ones, elder gods from beyond the rim of time and space, you know, all the Lovecraftian tropes, I wanted to visit a more positive side of, say, the religious experience within Lovecraft. I wanted to visit the idea that someone could come away from an experience of the supernatural, not terrified, but enlightened as to the nature of the universe, as to the nature of our condition as human beings. A lot of the germ for the Cthulhu Sattva anthology started with my book, When the Stars Are Right, Towards an Authentic Relay in Spirituality where I basically did exactly that. I took the great old ones, Lovecraft's monster gods, and, you know, found ways to uh, apply them to uh, a human life in such a way that that person came out benefited as opposed to, you know, horrified and damaged. (laughs) When the Stars Are Right, that's the non-anthology book that you put out through Martian Migraine? Yeah, it's sort of a a self-help book for weirdos. It's quote unquote nonfiction? Nonfiction, nonfiction, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back to Cthulhu Sattva. Please explain to the listeners the Buddhist meaning of Sattva as best you can, and then tell me how that relates to the Cthulhu universe. Well, in Buddhism, a bodhisattva is, of course, an enlightened being who has made the choice to stay within this realm in order to help others along the path to enlightenment. A Cthulhu Sattva is much the same, except the enlightenment is a dark enlightenment. It comes from a sort of almost a gleeful nihilism, if you can grok that. Uh, (laughs) So the Cthulhu Sattva is sort of a thematic character for the anthology. You've used the word enlightened a few times. Mm -hmm. And That word has different meanings to different people. I have heard you describe it as not necessarily gaining knowledge, but sometimes gaining the knowledge that you'll never gain the knowledge. Oh, absolutely. Could you maybe expand a little bit more on your definition of enlightenment? Because when I was hearing you talk about it, I was just blown away because it made so much sense that I never heard anybody talk about it like that. About enlightenment in general or specifically with... Specifically the way that you interpret enlightenment being that it's not just knowledge, but part of being enlightened is the knowledge that you'll never know everything. I think that becomes apparent as you enter into any sort of spiritual path is that you begin to apprehend exactly how much darkness is revealed by your growing light. I take the metaphor of the campfire. The bonfire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Build the bonfire. The larger you build the campfire and turn it into a bonfire and so on and so forth. You know, you get more light, you get more heat, you get more interaction, but at the same time, it reveals exactly how much darkness is beyond the firelight. Entering into that darkness is, you know, an act of bravery, but it's also an act of, I would almost say, a a self-compassion, right? Because you enter into a dark period in your life, and if you can keep your wits about you, right, you can come out the other side better than you were before. That, at least, is my theory, when the Stars Are Right, again, we, we talked about it. It is a nonfiction book that is true relay in spirituality, basically. Why mm-hmm. did you feel the need to write that book, and who did you write it for? I felt the need to write that book because there wasn't anything out there like it at the time. You know, there have been occult grimoires and various Lovecraftian books that have been very heavy on the magic side of things, on the occult practice side of things. As far as I knew at the time, this may have changed since then. I haven't really kept up. But at the time, no one had written anything in the genre that was quite like what I had in mind. 
it started off as a joke. You know, the idea of basing your spirituality off of pulpy monster gods from the 1930s and 40s. <laughs> but then the more I looked at it, the more I examined these characters, these creatures, the more I realized that they could be mapped onto a working spirituality and actually work. You see this sometimes in other genres as well. Well, for instance, in tarot cards, you'll see tarot cards that are done in every possible genre, every possible set of characters have been adapted into tarot cards, much the same. Why relay in? Why relay in? Well, in Lovecraft's uh, story, Call of Cthulhu, which we used as our base for that book, relay is a sunken fictional city at the bottom of the Pacific in which uh, Cthulhu, the lord of dreams and master of madness, basically sleeps in suspended animation. <laughs> so I wanted to base it there. And I wanted as well to say Relayan as opposed to Lovecraftian. I wanted to make it specific to that entity. Most of the book is about Cthulhu after all. Hey, Streetwalkers, here's a word from our sponsors. Let's get back into it. A lot of your early work was really focused around the Lovecraft universe. Mm -hmm. What about H.P. Lovecraft drew you in so wholly? I think it was his ability to, because he was a very fearful man. When you go into his biography, when you examine his life, he was a person who was, you know, largely afraid of everything. <laughs> and you can feel that in his fiction. I feel it's almost transformative. It's almost too much. I think lots of people, when they read Lovecraft, are like, oh, he's so verbose. You know, he's so overblown. The prose is very purple, but it all works. Like when you take it as a whole, as a gestalt, you know, he was touching on something very primal in the human experience. One of his famous quotes is, you know, the oldest type of fear is fear of the unknown. The oldest emotion in mankind is fear. It's, it was our first, probably. And fear of the unknown is the worst of our fears when we get right down to it. And he was able to write about that convincingly, even though much of the content was just completely wacky. That core fear at the center of it was primal, and uh, it just got to me. It got to me in a way that a lot of other writers don't. I'll be a Lovecraft fan till I die. <laughs> oh, rad. Can you explain what is Black Gnosis? Black Gnosis is related to the concept of the Cthulhu Sattva. The Black Gnosis is, again, going into that gleeful nihilism, you know, to the degree that you come out the other side with a greater appreciation for life as it is. We try to be as realistic as possible with this very unrealistic spirituality. <laughs> hmm. Moving on a little bit. Sure. What is Shout? Kill, Revel, Repeat. That is the title story in my uh, 2019 collection from Trepidatio Publishing. The whole book was called Shout, Kill, Revel, Repeat, and it's a collection of my uh, short, weird fiction from, oh, I want to say 2014 through to 2019. So this is a collection of your, only you as the author of all of these short stories? I am the sole author of that one, yep. <laughs> what made you put that out? And why didn't you put it out with Martian Migraine? Well, at the same time as, a, as I was running Martian Migraine Press, you know, I was putting out my own stories. I was, you know, looking for other publishers besides myself just to take some of the workload off. Why did I put it out? It was time. I was ready. It, I had enough short stories out there in circulation that when I approached that publisher, they signed on and were excited to produce the book for me, for themselves, really. Still doing well in sales, so they're happy with me. Good. Mm -hmm. You said you had put out several short stories. Where do you put out short stories? Like if I was looking for a place to read short stories, where would I go? Oh, well, uh, I was submitted to a lot of small presses, small presses like myself, mostly because I was familiar with them as a whole. How do you put them out? You just submit them. You find a publisher or a press who's doing open uh, submission calls. Sometimes you'll have themed submission calls where they're asking for stories with a particular bent to them. There are a couple of stories like that in Show, Kill, Revel, Repeat. 
but mostly I was just interested in uh, selling my work, you know. That's an aspect to writing that a lot of people find troublesome, but I enjoyed it. And of course, it's much easier now to submit because all uh, submissions are electronic. Whereas, you know, not to, well, let's call it at least 20 years ago, you know, you were still expected to send, you know, an actual hard copy of your story with a self-addressed stamped envelope so that they could return their rejection. (laughs) (laughs) I collected some rejections back in the day. How many did you get? How many rejections have I received? Yeah, do you still have them? I still have the ones in uh, in my Gmail. As for the paper ones that I used to receive way back in the day, I don't think I could put a number on them. Easily in the hundreds. How come you didn't give up? How come I didn't give up? Yeah, that's one of the things I like to explore on this show is what made people think they could do something and why they didn't give up when they were faced with some struggles. I want to say just sheer bloody mindedness. I knew my stuff was good. It was just a case of finding somebody who also agreed. (laughs) You know, when you enter into relationships with publishers, that's very much the vibe. They get you and can see your work as the product that it is. As an artist, as a writer, I try to, you know, be as practical with my work as possible in that it is, yeah, how to say it? I'm trying to English it here. (laughs) You can Canadian it. It's fine. Extra points if you use the Canadian word kerfuffle. Extra points for Canadian words, eh? Yeah, it's a it's a bit of a kerfuffle for sure. <laughs> That's a good one. Thanks for bringing that one up, Steve. <laughs> yeah, I just had a bloody mindedness about it. I knew that if I got it to the right press, then I could make sales. And eventually I did start to do that. You wrote, at least for a period of time, under a pseudonym. I did. Tell me about Justine and why you thought that was necessary. And was it necessary? That is a deep cut, Steve. Thank you. (laughs) You are welcome. Justine Jeffrey was my pen name for a while there. While I was writing basically, not to put too fine a point on it, but horror-themed smut. We can just say erotic fiction. (laughs) Yeah, we can say erotic fiction. But, you know, it was pretty blue stuff, mostly written as a lark. All Lovecraftian themed as well. Mostly put out as ebooks back in the day, because that's really where literary erotica sort of took off back in around 2015, 2016, where you were seeing a lot of ebooks out on Amazon where they're just produced really fast. It's basically the same production schedule as your regular pornography, I suppose. It's quick to make, quick to put out, <laughs> and quick to sell. So I really approached that as uh, Justine's work as uh, sort of a pot boiler, you know, that's going to keep the lights on. Did it? It did. It's It still does to a certain degree. I mean, I haven't promoted those books in ages, but, you know, I still get a little bit of income from them. <laughs> this is a weird idea that just occurred to me. Back in the olden days of like the very beginning of podcasting, I would listen to authors, horror, crime, whatever. You know, because they were trying to get a book deal or they were trying to get some notice from a publishing house. And so what they would do is they would release their fiction in podcast form. Oh, yeah. They'd put out episodes, you know, chapters, and they'd read them and blah, blah, blah. I know that for a while there, there was a lot of erotic fiction that was released that way. Right. I, I don't Maybe you have done it, but have you thought about releasing some of those stories as audio episodes? Oh, I don't know. They're pretty uh, pornographic at the end of the day. Would that sort of thing fly, do you think, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. 100%. Yeah, it's out there for sure. Well, it might be time for a resurgence. (laughs) I mean, if you got some time off, you know, just read some of that stuff into a microphone. And uh, if you can find a girl to do it, even better. (laughs) Even better. Well, that was my reason. Now that you bring bring that up, that was my reason for the female pen name. Because at the time... The ones that were selling the most, you got to shoot ducks where the ducks are, right? Were female or at least female presenting authors. I had a friend that I was working with at the time and she agreed to be the the face of Justine and thought it was an absolute hoot to do that. The word hoot was coming to mind when you were telling that story. <laughs> <It's a hoot. laughs> it was a good time. Maybe you can find some uh, a willing female voice that would be the Maybe. voice of Justine. Maybe. I feel like you're leaving money on the table there, Scott. Yeah, I think there's an audience for it, for sure. You might be right. (laughs) Uh, Switching gears again, just a little bit. You wrote a book called Stonefish. Now, for those listeners who are unfamiliar, 
A stonefish is the most venomous fish on the planet, and it has some very interesting camouflage techniques or capabilities. It does. What is stonefish about without any spoilers? Stonefish is a novel of weird horror and cyberpunk together again. To use the analogy of the stonefish, it's camouflage techniques, it's high toxicity. I basically use the stonefish as a metaphor to talk about ideas regarding the simulation. The simulation that we're all in? The idea that there's a non-zero chance that we're experiencing all this as some form of you know higher order simulation. There's a line in the book where I say there's camouflage and then there's camouflage. There's an extra layer to this. The idea that camouflaged entities and animals really give me pause. They cause me to think really deeply about the nature of what we're experiencing here. Because how does the stonefish in its evolution figure out that it's beneficial to look like a rock? Does it even cognize a rock? Is it even able to make sense of what a rock is? And yet it pretends to be one. Which I find fascinating in itself because it's the most venomous fish on the planet. So why does it even need to hide? Right. A lion is sunning itself on Pride Rock. It's not hiding. No, no, it's not. Because it has no predators. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really. Well, I, t- I take the idea of the stonefish and I expand it out so that the world itself is camouflaged, I feel, and carnivorous after a fashion. One of the main themes of Stonefish is the idea that the first law of the universe is that everybody is hungry. Everybody from doesn't matter what you are, whether you're a galaxy or a microbe, you are constantly consuming things. So that consuming nature of reality became the source of the horror in Stonefish. The idea that we are all prey for something. (laughs) Yeah, we're all prey for somebody. We're all prey for somebody, yeah. So Stonefish is your first novel, is that right? Yeah, it was my debut novel. It was put out by Word Horde in 2020. What made you feel like this story had enough legs in it to become a novel instead of just another short story? Mostly because I had so many ideas to throw into it. And I'm not giving anything away with this, but one of the main plot drivers of Stonefish is, are you familiar with Sasquatch? (laughs) Bigfoot? Uh, Yeah, my my daughter lives in the Pacific Northwest, so yes, I am very aware. Okay. So my theory about Sasquatch, in which I incorporated into Stonefish, is the idea that we all know the the tropes of the photographs or videos of, of Bigfoot that ever happen. They're always fuzzy. They're out of range. They're inconclusive when they find tracks in, in the wild or have this sort of anomalous quality to them. So my idea was that Sasquatch are real. Well, they're imaginary, (laughs) but they're just real enough to leave tracks. They're just real enough to impinge upon the structure of the simulation long enough that we get an impression of a Sasquatch. It seems to be that humans only ever see them for like half a minute at a time, and then they're gone. Long enough to get a blurry photograph, long enough to say, what was that? And get excited about it, but never long enough that you can actually just stay and watch them right? If we could stay and watch them, if they weren't the social distancing world champions like they are, I think we would see something very different. I think the Sasquatch is something that happens when humans go into wild spaces. It's some kind of holdover from our evolutionary past where we go into wild spaces, the forest, the woods, the desert, you know, anywhere. And by some virtue of how we've evolved, we perceive this thing when we go out there. It's like the wildness of nature being returned to us in a form that we can comprehend a little bit. So we see a large, hairy hominid, something like us, but not us. And we only see it for a fraction of time. I propose in Stonefish that if we were able to watch them longer, the camouflage would fall away and we would see what they really are. I think that's when we'd get into trouble. (laughs) Kind of like those posters from the 90s where if you stare at those dots long enough, you'll see a boat. Magic Eye. Yeah, those. Magic Eye, those were called. So it sounds like the Sasquatch has kind of the, uh, the cloaking camouflage technology of the Predator. Sure. 
You see them for a hot second and then all of a sudden they're gone because they blend it in with everything else. Yeah. My take on that is that their camouflage comes from a higher, they are themselves higher dimensional creatures, right? They are themselves something from elsewhere than here. And when they arrive, they put on these perceptual clothes, right? So they can hang around in the woods and generally mess things up. Of course, you know, Stonefish is a hor- is a horror novel. So I had to take that in horrific ways. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been very entertaining. <laughs> sure. We talked briefly about porn. And here's my theory about uh, Sasquatch. Yeah. I don't know how the stories go up in uh, Canada, the Great White North, as it were. But down here in America, a lot of young men's first interaction with porn, not so much now that it's all digital, but back when it was magazines and videos, young men and groups of kids would find porn stashes out in the woods. Out in the woods. Out in the woods, there'd just be stacks of magazines. Yeah, that happened up here too. (laughs) So since it happened everywhere across the continent, it is my theory that it was Sasquatch. (laughs) Sasquatch was out there planting porn like a Johnny Appleseed kind of, a Johnny Porn Seed all across the I guess the whole continent. That's my theory. That's why there's so much porn in the wilderness. In the that it was, and that's why nobody knows who put it there is because it was all done by Sasquatch. <laughs> I'm going to put out a short film and that's what it's going to be about. Hey, street walkers. Here's a word from our sponsors. Let's get back into it. Okay. So stonefish was your first novel, your debut novel, as it were. How hard was it to get a publisher to publish an unknown, or not unknown, but an unproven novelist's novel? How hard was that? How hard was that? Well, I did put it out to several publishers until Word Horde came back to me with with an offer. I would say, for me, not all that difficult. Is it because you were already in the space that you think it was maybe not as hard? I would agree with that for sure. Yeah. I had spent time, you know, as a publisher myself, as, as an editor, you know, I'd done work for other, other presses, you know, I had worked with Word Horde before, but in graphic design where I designed covers for their books, the owners of Word Horde really liked my work. So when it came time, I thought, well, I'll submit to them as well. And they took a chance on it. That's basically all you can hope for. When you were submitting it, was it finished or were you submitting a proposal? No, it was finished. I'm a completist. So, you know, when as soon as I knew that it was done, that's when I started sending it out. But that was a process of, you know, running it by beta readers and getting it edited properly, you know, hiring an editor. So I think it's interesting that even though you edited your own press for a while, well, why did you feel it was need to get an outside editor? I mean, you have experience editing. Why didn't you do it? I just didn't trust myself with my own stuff too precious about it? I don't know that I would be too precious, but uh, certainly I wanted an outside eye. Because it's hard to kill your own babies? To some degree, sure, yeah. But also, you know, you just want to get a fresh perspective. An unbiased one? Yeah, when you sit down and you write these things, you're with them every day for like a year. That's about how long it takes for me to complete a book. And you just get too close to it to see it as a whole sometimes. So, yeah, I was very interested in getting somebody to actually come in and do an editing pass. I'm a very much a, a writer who edits as he writes, constantly changing things back and forth. So you're you're not like Stephen King where you just start writing and you keep writing until you run out of cocaine? <laughs> I'll pound out a passage for about an hour and then tap out, then go back and edit usually the next day or, or later on that day. It's not the best way to work. It certainly has reduced my speed as as a writer, but I think it makes uh, for a more uh, careful and enjoyable book at the end of it. When you're writing a book, do you know the ending before you write it? Like, do you know the destination before you map the way there? With Stonefish, I didn't. With Stonefish, I had scenes in my head, various set pieces, right, that I knew I wanted to hit. And I had my themes going in. But when the end came, I like to be surprised because surprise in the writer means surprise in the reader. So when the end came, when the end became apparent, 
you know, as, as I'm writing about three quarters of the way through, I'm like, I got to wrap this up. The wrapping up became clearer as, as, as I moved forward in, into the book. Nice. Again, switching gears one more time. I've heard of autobiography, but what is autofiction? Autofiction is related to autobiography in that what I've done with autofictional work is you take your life as it is, and then you skew it in another direction. It still has most of the elements of the actual happenings, right, that you're writing about, but you just skew it into a, a fictional world. You're uh, looking at it through a different filter. It's the same story, but uh, just some of the names have been changed. Some, <laughs> not all. <laughs> Got you. Now that brings us to hashtag summer of drill. Mm -hmm. You have a new book coming out this summer. I do. It is called Drill. What is this book about? Drill is an auto fictional meta narrative. It's a revenge thriller. It's a psychedelic horror. One beta reader called it a live grenade. My publisher thinks it's a dangerous book. And so I'm happy that they're taking a chance. on it. They think it's dangerous. They think it's a dangerous book in that sense that when it's read, it's designed to change the reader. I focus a lot on the idea of the William S. Burroughs' third mind concept. I don't call myself an author. I call myself the writer. And then on the other end of that relationship is the reader. And between the reader and the writer, the author is created. The author is a third mind. I find books of this type fascinating because they propose to actually change the world at some base level. William Burroughs talked about this too. His concepts with his writing, who I'm a big fan of, it's Lovecraft, Burroughs, and uh, Philip K. Dick. <laughs> For me, that's my trinity. But the way I've written it, the way I've built the book from the ground up has been designed to change the reader's mindscape, specifically in regards to their concepts about God. This book is going to be marketed as a book that kills God, which I know is going to probably upset some people. Maybe one or two. It's designed to upset. But more specifically, it's designed to uh, murder a specific deity. I grew up in a cult. That cult was the Jehovah's Witnesses. In the course of my life, escaping from that cult, losing my family to it, I'm shunned by the majority of my family, except for my littlest sister, who is also out of the cult. She escaped a couple of years ago, her and her hubby. It's about that. It's about the religious trauma, the sort of the uh, PTSD you get from growing up in this kind of uh, scenario. For the longest time, you know, I didn't think anything about it. I moved on with my life. I escaped the cult back in the last century, you know, so I've been out for longer than I was ever in. But recent uh, revelations regarding that religious organization and how they function and the dangerous aspects of them, which I don't think many people are aware of, I wanted to make that clear. It's going to be an expose of the Jehovah's Witness cult, among many other things hopefully as well as an entertaining book. <laughs> Why did you decide to write this book, which according to basically your, your own description is sort of an attack on, on the J-dubs? Why? Why now? Why now? Well, as it happened, I was working on another book at the time when Drill came up into my consciousness. The reason was largely personal I had been shunned by my father and most of my family. Then my sister and her husband escaped from the cult and were immediately also shunned. And I think it was that that sort of triggered me. I've, I felt very activated to write it when I learned what had happened to my sister. It was fine for me to be shunned. I was like, well, what, what do you expect? You know, I'm a terrible person as far as they're concerned. So... It wasn't a big deal when it was just me. But when my littlest sister, you know, also received this treatment, I was like, this will not stand. You know, this kind of destruction of families that happens with these groups, you know, and it's not just the Jehovah's Witnesses. There's all kinds of groups who practice these kind of destructive practices. When it happened to my sister, I kind of lost it. And I decided to uh, basically curse my father for what he was doing to our family for breaking us up like he was doing. You know, it's the great wound of my life that this happened. So drill is my response to that. 
So you got out of the JW when you were like 27, and you said you've been out of it longer than you were ever in it. I mean, you said that it was the great hurt or whatever, but again, why now? I mean, you've had arguably 20 plus years to write this book. Yeah. Was it your sister's shunning that really precipitated you to put the pen to the paper? Well, it was the trigger for it. And then as I entered into actually, actually writing the thing, I realized how much pent up and not processed psychological damage that I've received. It was a real eye opener in terms of my mental health. I realize now after writing Drill that my mental health would be far, far different had I not grown up as a Jehovah's Witness. I think the pain and the constant strife of growing up in that organization really impacted me. I'm currently on a actually short-term mental health disability for that very thing because I've found myself unable to work. Is that something that you want me to cut out or are you okay with leaving that in? Oh, I'm fine with that in. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine with that in. I'm very open about mental health awareness and mental health issues. I was going to ask you, but I, that might have been the answer. Did writing this book help you cope with all of that? It helped and it harmed. It was great to get clarification through the writing, but at the same time, it was, well, it's that dark enlightenment we were talking about earlier. It was a little much to basically stew in Jehovah's Witness cult material for a year while I wrote it. <laughs> Very difficult. Yeah, it seems like taking yourself back to the trauma, the scene of the crime. Yeah, I did. Hopefully that makes it an entertaining uh, novel. It kind of reminds me, like the actions that you took, you know, sitting in it and sort of reliving it to a degree reminds me of, I don't remember which step it is, but in the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program, one of the steps is that you find all of the people that you did harm, you make amends to them. Yeah. And in a way, it seems like a really selfish thing because depending on how long ago these transgressions were, they might be over it. <laughs> they might have gotten over it. And then sure. you're just knocking on their door to make yourself feel better, but you're rehashing it and bringing it back up to them, which seems a little bit selfish to me. <laughs> so it seems like you kind of imposed that uh, on yourself, you know, to a degree to relive it. And it brought back all of that trauma. And I know I asked you if it helped, and you, you said it kind of helped and hurt, but I guess my overall question about that event is, was it worth it? Yes. Why? It was worth it in that it's kind of come at a time in my life where it's going to precipitate change now that I've written it, now that it's out there. Change in you or change in the world, or both? Both. I've coded a number of blessings into this little curse that I wrote, <laughs> right, as well. So no, there will be change for me. I'm convinced that uh, once it gets readership, once people are aware of it, what I'm trying to do with Drill is basically, you know, expose the cult for what it is. But also I believe literally that their God exists as a kind of mimetic entity in the newest sphere or, of, you know, the sphere of mental awareness and cognition and consciousness that we all produce, and, you know, in our billions on this planet we produce this sphere of thought. And that's where things like Jehovah, the God, latch on to that sphere and are able to feed themselves basically through the medium of belief. I think gods exist in a very sort of real and practical way and that they can be burnt out. They can be burned out of the mental sphere of human awareness. I'm using pop culture and writing to do it. The more people are aware of the witnesses and the more people are aware of their God, Jehovah, the less power that entity is going to have in the world, is my theory going in. <laughs> Why the title Drill? Drill is... Or is that a spoiler? <laughs> uh, no, not really. Unlike in Stonefish, where I envision, you know, reality is camouflage for, for something else, I had the world building idea of the drill, or the idea that an entire reality basically is constantly spinning, 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 and it's drilling into something, a higher dimensional bulk or substrate, and that all of our activities from the smallest microbe up to galaxies, again, you know, are all spinning and turning in this effort to uh, bore away at the surrounding material. It's one of the conceits of drill, and uh, it 
just comes up so many times that I decided to call the novel drill itself. Got you. Other than hashtag summer of drill and hashtag JW, what can we do to help social media wise? Well, I mean, those hashtags are great. Hashtag drill, hashtag drill novel, hashtag summer of drill. Basically, what I'm hoping to do is get enough people working those hashtags and uh, affecting the algorithm. I would like it so that by summertime of 2024, when the book is out, it's going into pre-release in May and then actual release in June, June 14th, I believe. Not too long from now, but by summertime, I was hoping for uh, anytime anybody searches for Jehovah's Witnesses, they also hear about Drill, the novel that kills God. Interesting. So basically, I need readers, Steve. (laughs) (laughs) Are you going to be doing any book signings? Are you going to go on tour with this book? Nothing has been planned as yet, but I'll let you know. Okay. Scott, where can people find you on social media? They can find me on Facebook. I'm on I'm there, Facebook, Twitter. I'm also on, uh, recently went on TikTok. Uh, so I'm putting out a lot of videos about drill on TikTok. Uh, my uh, handle there is Pimp My Shoggoth. <laughs> <laughs> How do you spell that? That's uh, P-I-M-P-M-Y Shoggoth, S-H-O-G-G-O-T-H. <laughs> gotcha. And why did you decide on that? <laughs> That was just an old uh, name for an old production company I had when I was younger. I just kept it. (laughs) I love it. As we're heading out here, is there anything I didn't ask you or we didn't talk about that you specifically wanted to talk about today? Like, did we cover the basics? Steve, your coverage was excellent. Oh, check you out. Oh, man. Scott R. Jones. From Cthulhu to Catharsis, all in one episode, man. (laughs) Uh, Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day and your hectic novel writing schedule to hang out and let us get to know you a little bit better on Fascination Street, man. I really appreciate it. No problem, Steve. I appreciate your time, Scott. Thank you so much, dude. You have a great rest of your day, and I'll talk to you later, buddy. Thanks, Steve. This was really great. Oh, dude, seriously, pleasure was all mine. It was a very fascinating conversation. We went everywhere and I I learned a lot and I feel like we got a lot done, man. So yeah, you're a great interview, Steve. Thanks, man. Have a great day, dude. Steve, thanks so much. Bye-bye. All right, bye. Opening music is the song FSP theme written, performed, and provided by Ambush Vin. Closing music is from the song Say My Name off the 2021 album Underdog Anthems used with permission from Jax Hollow. If you like the show, tell a friend. Subscribe and rate and review the show on iTunes and wherever else you download podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. All the episodes are available there as well. Check me out on Vero at Fascination Street Pod and TikTok at Fascination Street Pod. And again, thanks for listening. <laughs>